Well, hey everybody, Rob Ferry here. Man, what is going on with 2020? Every day there seems to be a new challenge. I was talking with the kids a few days ago and they observed and shared with me and called me to remember in January, we had the incident where the US drone was shot down and we were wondering about World War III possibly. Then in February, Australia erupted into fire, an entire continent, and the koala population was decimated. In March, the coronavirus was ramping up. Quarantines, masks, now over 100,000 dead here in America, 40 million unemployed. Then in April, the murder hornets made their way to American soil. In May, several high-profile racial incidents with more black men dead, the most recent being the horrific and unconscionable death of George Floyd, and now as we've rolled into June, protests and riots and looting without any sign of abating. And you just got to think, golly, what is going on with 2020? I mean, this is getting pretty overwhelming. Our problems seem to be mounting and pressure is building on us as human beings to try to make sense of it all. The deep perplexities of our inhumanity and our capability for evil is confounding us. Perhaps... For most of us, most on our hearts and minds at this moment, is the unacceptable and senseless death of Mr. Floyd. We don't need more facts, a standard byline I've used in similar past incidents, before arriving at moral indignation. When we see something as evil as a person in power harming and killing a powerless person who is not fighting back, who simply cannot breathe, and anger erupts in us. It's a good reminder that something has gone terribly wrong in this world, that something has violated an unbreakable law fixed by God that is to rule over all peoples and races and cultures. And we can't accept that, and we will not accept that. The collective anger and sadness we feel appeals to a moral standard of right and wrong set by God, whether or not folks out there know him or not. It was Will Smith who said that racism isn't getting worse, it's getting filmed. George Floyd's final moments were filmed for all of us to witness. Our conscience and our humanity inform us that this was unquestionably wrong. These times like this force us all into the uncomfortable position of having to sit with contradictions. People in groups can be both bad and good simultaneously. In fact, they usually are. For example, as many justifiably rage against police brutality, including Broncos head coach Vic Fangio in a statement yesterday, we must also acknowledge what Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said in an interview I saw two nights ago, where he recognized that 98-99% of police do a tremendous job, including brothers and sisters I know in law enforcement and their children and my brother-in-law's son who's training for law enforcement. Undoubtedly, as Kareem said, they're in tough situations, and we must all we can do all we can do to correct that percentage who don't do a great job on a daily basis. The point is, when we see sin, no matter which side we see it on, we need to identify it for what it is. People and groups can be both good and bad simultaneously, and we're all thrust into this uncomfortable position of having to sit with those contradictions. Evidence can be complicated, situations complex, and they can even suggest contradictory conclusions. And we need to be prepared to sit with these. I know that our minds will try to push us to be comfortable on one side of the fence or the other, but don't let your fall, yourself fall into mental complacency. Life is complicated. Issues are complex. And we get thrown into the messy middle where we're forced to grapple with uncertainty. This is one factor that makes these types of issues so gut-wrenching and charged. Many, unfortunately, will opt out of the uncomfortability and will wait and hope for things to calm down so they can go back to normal. But we cannot afford to do that as humans nor as Christians. Again, for a life to be taken on the charge of buying something at a deli with an alleged counterfeit bill, for a life to be taken for this reason is simply unthinkable and unacceptable. We must somehow recapture and resensitize ourselves to our humanness. 
We must lament the sex senseless acts of violence that were brought on by senseless acts of violence in this loop that we get stuck into. We must uh, avoid devolving into what becomes a litany of finger pointing and blame shifting. A few days ago, while watching Jimmy Kimmel's monologue, he broadcast a video that has since gone viral. In it, Nashville actor Tyler Merritt, in a close-up, recites a monologue entitled, Before You Call the Cops. Merritt, who is black, reveals facts about his life, ranging from the mundane to the serious, noting that he hates the notion that anyone at all might possibly be afraid of him. In the video, he shares his likes, his dislikes. He shares that he knows all the lyrics to N.W.A. Straight Outta Compton, as well as, perhaps surprisingly to some, all the words to the musical Oklahoma. In doing all this, he concludes by saying, I just wanted you to get to know me better before you call the cops. This video resonated as an appeal to me not to see color, but to see the human. To stop making judgments and to see people as human beings. To treat all people as equals. To see beyond skin color. To get to know people. To talk with them. Ask them questions. Listen to them. Seek to understand. To do our best to avoid prejudging or showing prejudice. Prejudging. Before we've even shared one conversation with others. Tyler Merritt's appeal in his video, Before You Call the, call the Cops, is an appeal to get to know people better and deeper. We who call ourselves disciples can likely paraphrase passages in the Bible that say things like, there's neither Jew nor Greek, uh, slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one, yet are we? Am I acting that way? Am I avoiding certain people? Do I nervously engage others different than me? You know, when I go out hiking or walking or mountain biking, I don't worry or look over my shoulder. In my talks with some of my brothers and sisters and friends of color, I've learned that that's not true. My children have never been pulled over for no reason. Like others maybe who have been pulled over, trembling in fear, wondering, is this on tape? Is there anybody watching? How's this going to go down? Solutions seem to evade us, but what is clear is that if we take some time to engage with real live folks, we will see there is justified anger, hurt, pain, fear, frustration that our brothers and sisters and friends of color are experiencing. Many are scared. They want to hope for the best, for change, for improvement, but honestly, many have been enduring challenges for so long that hope has worn very thin. If a friend, for example, is diagnosed with cancer, we might expect many of the same feelings, anger, hurt, fear, anxiety, being scared, being concerned, and all that would be perfectly normal. And most likely, for many of us, we would not ignore those things. We would call, we would visit, we'd drop by the house or hospital, we'd check in, we'd phone over, how can I pray for you? Hey, what's the update today? By the way, how are things going? And yet we have friends and brothers and sisters feeling these ways right now. Those of color that are feeling these things. And maybe in those situations, if we were honest, we would have to say ourselves, you know what? I've not made any calls. I've not sent a card. I was afraid to check in. I haven't taken the time yet to express any concern. I haven't asked, hey, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? Is there anything I can help out with? I do know this, our brothers and sisters of color need to hear from us. Hear from us, white folk. I imagine you have pain. I see you. I hear you. I love you. Just as we would do for anyone being gripped by great pain, deep hurts, and profound fears. It's simply the human thing to do. I'm planning on filming a few more episodes, if you will, to advance this discussion of seeking answers to injustice and racism by helping us all look to God and Jesus and Christianity as our best hopes. In that first episode, we'll talk about the humanity of Christianity. You know, we don't need a new government program or a nice lecture. Those are fine. They may help and they may enlighten. 
But you want to know what God's solution to angry racism that gives birth to challenges? Well, his solution is to see every person on the planet as God sees them, as human, as equal, as made in the image of God, nothing less. In the second episode, we'll look at Jesus, the ultimate equality advocate. No major faith apart from Christianity mandates a deep commitment to the equality of all people. So Christianity, properly practiced, is our best hope for a better way forward. And then in the final episode, we'll tackle the question of, okay, now what? For when all is said and done, what we really need is the heart of Jesus living through ourselves, our hands, and our feet, and our hearts. Scriptures throughout the Bible call each of us to action whenever there's injustice or oppression or when human rights are being trampled. None of us can ignore or sidestep that responsibility. It's not okay to defend the status quo and kind of wait for things to calm down so we can move on. And we certainly don't need silent guilt. Instead, we need some bravery and some action. And so in that episode, I'll share some practical things I'm doing, some other brothers and sisters, some things they're doing, and propose some ideas uh, that I've gleaned from talking with some of my friends and, and, and brothers and sisters of color that we can implement to be a part of making this situation better for all. We have to do better. I have to do better. I hope you'll join me, and I look forward to seeing you next time.